Welcome to our special coverage of the public memorial for longtime Micron CEO Steve Appleton. It is scheduled to begin in just a moment or so here. We are taking you live right now to Taco Bell Arena for this morning's memorial. As you can see, the stage getting set there. A beautiful sight, even at Taco Bell Arena. Let's take a minute and look back at Steve Appleton's professional life as the longtime CEO. Appleton was born and raised in California. He came to Boise to attend Boise State University, where as an avid tennis player, that is some of his legacy. His career at Micron started after his graduation from Boise State way back in 1983. And he started at Micron back in 83. He worked the night shift in production. He worked his way up the ladder holding a number of positions and was eventually appointed president and COO in 1991. His story is so incredible. In 1994, he was appointed as CEO at only 34 years old. By the way, he was the third youngest CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Think about that. Appleton actually walked away from another plane crash just south of the Boise Airport. That one happened in 2004. Steve Appleton's family said their final goodbyes earlier this month. I mean, there was estimated between 400 and 500 guests attend that private funeral. Of course, that included family and friends, co-workers, notable figures like Governor Butch Otter, Boise Mayor Dave Beter, Boise State President Bob Kustra, Boise State football coach Chris Peterson, and former Idaho Senator Larry Craig, Micron officers, and the 1980 Boise State men's tennis team actually lined the pavement for the processional as eight pallbearers carried Appleton's casket up and down the church steps. That program featured Steve Appleton's family life. There was no mention of money and career. After the service, family and friends lined up for a uh, uh, procession and graveside service at Dry Creek Cemetery. The ceremony was marked by a civilian missing man flyover. Let's go to Taco Bell Arena. On behalf of Delin and the Appleton family, Steve's extended family at Micron and the community of Boise, I want to extend a welcome to all of you who are here today to honor Steve and celebrate his life. My comments this morning will center around two basic thoughts that I have around Steve. One is his professional leadership, and one is underneath the professional side of Steve, the person he was. When I joined Micron six years ago, Steve taught me a lot about career advancement and how to manage my career, and he said there's three things you have to do at Micron to succeed. First, you have to be aggressive and take risk. Second, so this is the risk I took on a Navy SEAL training in San Diego with Steve. I was dumb enough to try to wrestle Steve on the beach. So that's the first thing is I took a risk. The second concept is do whatever you can to win. And that was Steve in the workplace. So here I knew I was about to get crushed by Steve and I pulled his shirt over his head so I could try to get out of, without getting hurt. The third part is, uh, of the lesson I learned from Steve was get to the right result. And uh, anyone who knows Steve knows that this is the only resu result that Steve would know. And uh, I think I did the right thing for my career at Mike Ron as well. <laughs> About 18 months ago, I was going to the airport on a trip to London. and. Uh, we had a, a meeting with one of our largest customers at a trade show over in London. Steve was there celebrating his anniversary with Delin over the weekend. And uh, I, I had not yet locked down a hotel room. And Steve found out about that through his assistant, April, and uh, called me direct and said, uh, Adams, why don't you stay in our room? And I started cracking up out loud. I said. Steve, of all things, I never thought I'd be uh, sleeping over with the Appletons. And he quickly set me straight. He said, I've been in the memory business close to 30 years, and I've seen it all. And if there's one thing you should never say is never say never. But he said, I'm about to break that rule, Adams, because there's no way you'll ever spend the night in the hotel room with me. <laughs> but of course, underneath that, Steve's offer was that he would go find a hotel room while I was on the plane. 
That little gesture to me told me a lot about Steve. You know, CEO and chairman of a Fortune 500 company, and yet he was gonna go work on my hotel room while I was on a plane ride over. Whether it was something as simple as giving up a hotel room in London, or bringing gifts and financial aid to an orphanage in Mexico while driving the Baja 1000, or his continued pursuit in the development of the community of Boise and Boise State University, Steve loved to help others. Steve never let success change who he was. He was compassionate and truly loved the people around him. He would do anything for anyone. Stephen Covey wrote a book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. The second of the seven habits is to begin with an end in mind. The basic premise of the habit is live your life like you would like others to describe you at the end. We are fortunate today to have a collection of friends who will share their experiences with Steve from many different parts of his life along his incredible journey. I think by the end of our ceremony today, we will all be able to attest that Steve was a highly successful person. First and foremost in his love for his family and for his friends. Also for his professional accomplishments, his competitive pursuits, and his charitable ways. We'd like to begin today's ceremony with an invocation from Pastor Ritchie. Pastor? Let us pray together. Lord, you are the creator of life and the giver of all that is good. And so we thank you for your creation, the life of Steve Appleton, a life that touched so many, a life of incredible value, not only in our eyes, but so much more in your eyes, O oh Lord. This morning we hold to your promises, God, that your amazing grace is poured out upon us even in the desert, that you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you for loving Steve. Thank you for loving us, Father. And Father, I pray this morning that you will comfort all who are here today. Provide your peace which surpasses our understanding. Lord, you promise that you are with us, not distant, but very near. Like your psalmist declares, you are always with us and you hold us by our right hand. You guide us with your counsel and afterward, you will take us into your glory. Whom have we in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing we desire besides you. Although our flesh and our hearts may fail, God, you are the strength of my heart, and you are my portion forever. And as we remember Steve's life today, may rays of joy break through the clouds of grieving. All glory and honor to you, Heavenly Father, the giver of such a beautiful gift to us, the life of Steve Appleton. Amen. Good morning, my name is Sal Fish, and I'm the CEO of SCORE International, which is the off-road organization that Steve uh, competed in. I'd like to uh, first of all thank the Appleton family for including me in this celebration. It's quite an honor to have the opportunity to be here with um, friends of Steve, uh, people that I have not had the opportunity to meet in the past because the racing community is a pretty 
narrow community, and I think most of you people probably have never even heard of Baja California. It's a piece of land uh, south of San Diego. It runs approximately 1,000 miles from uh, the Tijuana border to Cabo San Lucas. And uh, I met Steve approximately the year 2006, received a phone call uh, from him at my office, and he just introduced himself, uh, didn't say anything about Micron, and even if he did, I hate to embarrass myself, but I didn't know what Micron was. I'm a little older than most people in this room, and I'm not a uh, computer savvy as I should be, but it didn't mean anything to me. Uh, he just wanted to talk about racing and said he was going to enter uh, the Baja 1000, which is an event that we put on. And he said, I'm going to come into town. I had no idea where he was from, and he said, I'd like to go to lunch. We went to lunch. It was supposed to be about an hour lunch, about four hours later. Um, the two of us, I think, really had something to talk about, and we really liked each other. It was obvious that we were uh, shared a lot of the same interests and drive that Steve had. And Steve is the kind of guy that, um, like a lot of people, they have a bucket list. And uh, the bucket list is something that they want to, whether it's two things or 20 things in their life, they want to do and say they did it and then move on. Well, Steve, I believe his bucket list was not just doing something and putting it on his shelf or telling his buddies that he did it. I learned that when he wanted to do something, he really did it. He, not, he didn't want to do it, he wanted to excel at what he was doing. And he did that in his racing effort. Here is a gentleman that could have been anywhere in the world during the times that our races took place with his family, and he chose to be in the middle of the desert in Baja California or Baja California Sur and compete with the most grueling, unbelievable circumstances in an off-road race. His first race was in 2006. It was called the Takati Score Baja 1000. It started in Ensenada and ended in La Paz, basically 1,017 miles of everything that you could put into um, a most difficult situation. Steve and his brother uh, competed. Steve never got out of the car. They both ran the entire race. They finished, won the event, which was incredible, and it hooked him. He not only wanted to build his own vehicle, he was in a uh, rented vehicle at the time. He came back, built a state-of-the-art Class 1, which is an open, unlimited race car. And he competed uh, right up until January of this year when he raced at our first race of the year in uh, Laughlin, Nevada. He decided he wanted to go from Class 1, which is a high, they look like Indianapolis cars, but they go, they have travel of 36 inches, um, 700 horsepower engines. They go up, down, left, right, upside down, through washes, silt. Uh, banditos shoot at them as they're driving by. It's a crazy event, and Steve just really loved it. Uh, it. It was his element. I mean, you wouldn't know that he was the CEO of a company this size and that he was doing the things that he was doing all around the world. I think one of the common threads that you're probably going to hear today from the other speakers is the fact that Steve was a giving person. Uh, Baja is a, a unique peninsula. There's a lot of poverty down there, um, things of that nature. Steve just didn't come down and become a racer. He became part of the community of Baja. Uh, never made a grandstand, never wanted a press um, release about it or didn't call a, a press conference. But no, he would come down with group of people from your industry here and bring toys, clothing, food to orphanages, to different people along the Baja Peninsula. He was just a, a remarkable, remarkable person, but a competitor. He wanted to win, and he, he was one of those guys that when he, as I said earlier, when he decided he wanted to do something, he was only going to do it one way, and that was 110%. One of the things about our sport that I've been preaching for about 39 years is that it is a family endeavor. It's where the family could get together, come down, take a vacation, but yet have a great time. And I hope and I think you are going to see some clips of what Steve has done in the Baja and his racing, but his family was around him at all times. And uh, there's a beautiful, beautiful video that uh, Steve put together about his race team and his family.
showing how all of them would get together with France and come down to Baja and be a part of it. And I think that, when you look at Steve and look at his eyes and his expression and his family all around him, that's what he really represented. I think that's what he passed on to each and every one that knew him. Just a remarkable, remarkable man. You know, he was a leader, an innovator, a philanthropist, but more importantly, he was a loving husband, a father, son, and a great friend to me personally and to the off-road community. We're really going to miss him, uh, but this is a celebration and this is the way I know he would like it. I know that he was building a brand new SCORE trophy truck. Um, I believe he was going to, we have a race in two weeks, and I think he was going to compete in that San Felipe race in San Felipe, Baja, California. I'm not sure where that vehicle is today, and I just hope that his family, anything I could do to help out and, and see what they want to do about that, I'll be more than happy to help out in that way. You know, the unique situation, Steve named his team the Bad Apple. Um, and that was a very unique <laughs> name to have a race team. And, you know, his, his vehicles were painted. Everything was first class, as you know, the way he did things. But I will tell you, I think that Bad Apple is going to be a golden apple in God's eye where Steve is right now. I want to thank you very much for allowing me to have, share a few moments. You will see a video that will show what Steve really did in Baja. To the family, thank you for being such a strong part of our organization. I love you very much. Thank you. Is my dad there? Yeah. Ooh. This year we salute Steve as Father of the Year. He's good at basketball and flying. He's cool and he's fun. He's the best because he's loving. He likes to be with his family. That's a fact. If I had only known 
It was my last night by your side I'd pray a miracle to stop the dawn And when you smiled at me I would look into your eyes And make sure you know my love for you If I had only known All the love I would have shown If I had only known Hi, babe. Babe, do you love me? Who are you talking to? Me. I sure do. And now, the grand finale. Maybe you can perform at the fair. Is this going to be on YouTube? OK, buddy, don't make a mistake. Good morning, my name is Greg Herrick, uh, a business associate in the early days and a subsequent uh, longtime friend of Steve's. Steve Appleton was the brother that I never had. <clears throat> I'll never forget the first time we spoke. He called me and introduced himself as a new president of Micron and asked me to come to Boise to rekindle merger talks between my company, Zeos International, and Micron's computer division. When I arrived in Steve's office, after a brief discussion of the business opportunity, Steve asked me what I did for fun. I said that besides working, what I really liked to do was fly. His eyes lit up and he said he too was a pilot. And he said, let's figure out how to get this deal done and we can go out to the airport and go flying. <clears throat> it took us just 30 minutes to sketch out a billion dollar deal on his whiteboard. And it was a win-win for everybody and Steve said, I can sell my guys on it if you can sell yours. We agreed, shook hands, and took off for the airport. That was the first of hundreds of flights with Steve, either as a passenger or taking turns as each other's wingman. We had so many great flights together we flew from Florida to Alaska and from deep into Me in Mexico up into Canada. Steve was an extraordinary pilot. Each year a group of us would fly from Boise to western Mexico in our small two-passenger backcountry airplanes. Once there we would fly between the beautiful Copper Canyon in the Sierra Madre Mountains across the Sea of Cortez and up and down the length of Baja, California. Words cannot describe the beauty of these places, and Steve appreciated every minute of it. Flying along the pristine coast of Baja, we were frequently no more than 500, uh, pardon me, 50 to 100. 500 is a legal limit, I slipped there. <clears throat> Above the, uh, that was Mexico though, crystal clear water. Occasionally, a suitable landing area would pass under our wings and we would wheel around landing on the beach to explore the beaches or climb into some abandoned ruin we had seen. Sometimes we would run across a small temporary hut along the beach serving as a restaurant for the local fishermen. On our last trip we stopped at one such place along the Pacific coast. It was a family of three, a mother, a father, and their son. They were cooking up some 
freshly caught fish and some shrimp, and making fish tacos. So we ordered our lunch, and Steve quietly inquired about the family, that family just struggling to make a living there on the beach. Steve cared about people, even that family re we randomly ran into on our lunch break. I learned only last week from David McDonald, who was flying with us on that trip, that Steve had quietly obtained the family's contact information and sent them a very large care package when he got home. We had so many flying adventures. In fact, we were supposed to leave on another Baja trip this coming week. See, Steve loved coming back to Minnesota and flying around in float planes. I remember one trip flying back from Minneapolis in our two little float planes. We were flying west, and about midway through South Dakota, we were getting a little bored. These things only go about 90 miles an hour. Steve was a few miles behind me, and I spied the only open water in sight. It was an impossibly small L-shaped cow pond, complete with cows. I described the location on the radio to Steve and jokingly said I'd see him on the water. A few minutes later, I was continuing west, and Steve's voice came over the radio, and he said, Hey, where are you? Yep, you guessed it. I said, well, where are you? And he said, I'm on this cow pond waiting for you. I didn't believe it, and I circled back, and sure enough, there he was, standing on the float, waving at me. I summoned all my skills and managed to sail over Steve and touch down on that cow pond. I went all the way to the end and tried to miss the cows and got stuck in the weeds. I had to jump out in water up to here to push my airplane free. I was literally a stinking mess, but we were both laughing so hard it didn't matter. That was yet another, another great adventure with Steve. Steve was such an extraordinary man. As you know, he flew a lot of type of aircraft in addition to the ones that I've described. He entertained tens of thousands of people at air shows and was a, a consummate supporter of aviation. He donated significantly to the National Young Eagles Kids Program operated by the EAA. He very much enjoyed flying, and he has more friends in aviation than you can possibly imagine, and our community will certainly miss him. Steve lived his life being the very best at everything. He was a great pilot, an outstanding family man, a black building karate or jiu-jitsu or whatever it was, I don't know anything about it, but it was difficult to get, I know. He was a champion car racer and so much more. It happened that we lost him flying, and we try to make sense of that, but we cannot. What we do know is that Steve lived his life to the fullest. We are all better people because Steve is such a positive part of who we are. In some great or small ways, Steve lives in all of us. In closing, I'd like to read a poem written by a man much like Steve. John McGee, Jr. was also a man of the world. He was an American aviator born in China. He fought in the Battle of Britain and was lost a few weeks after writing these words. The name of the poem is High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark nor eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod, 
through high, untrespassed silence of space, I've put out my hand and touched the face of God. I used to think tennis was very exciting. And then I see that maybe it was just the start of all these incredible things. I'm Greg Patton, the tennis coach at Boise State. I wish I had been Steve Appleton's coach. The recognition of greatness in our midst is vital for a coach, but it's even more vital in terms of life. And I'm no dummy. I had a chance. I had a chance. I always wished I could have coached Steve Appleton. I had a chance. Back in 1980, 1979, I was a coach at UC Irvine. And I was, obviously what we do is we go out and we beat the bushes and see what falls out of the trees, which is you go recruit at tournaments. And I recruited Steve Appleton's doubles partner. Never really thought about it until 13 years later, I come up to Boise State and I hear about this urban legend, Steve Appleton, and I think, gosh, I know that name. And then I realized, you know, Steve Appleton was probably one of the best players that had played at Boise State for all those years. And I thought, my God, that was Chris Emery's doubles partner. Chris played for me at UC Irvine. So I had to take drastic action right away. And I called Steve up, and this is in 1993. And we met. 
just a lob away from where I'm standing right now were the chain link tennis courts that were right in the middle of the campus. And I met Steve there, and I said, Steve, one of the best things I ever did, well, the first thing he said is, Greg, you made a big mistake. <laughs> and I couldn't go with that, so I said, Steve, one of the best things I ever did was not recruit you to, to become an anteater. I just followed you up here to become a Bronco. I have such great gratitude for everything that Steve has done in the lives, especially in the loss, was especially with my team, because he was an incredible mentor. And he made my young men understand what a self-made man was all about. And we would go see Steve every year. We would go through Micron, and he made everybody feel so special. And here's these 19, 20-year-olds, and all of a sudden they're understanding what life's about because they're meeting a man of substance. And I always remember when we talked about this just a few weeks ago, and one of my players, and he said this best, well, he said, it wasn't a few weeks ago, it was just last week, and he goes, Coach, did you realize that Jeremy Lin with the New York Knicks is the incarnation of Steve Appleton? And I thought about it, and I thought, how great is it that he isn't playing basketball, but that we had him in our sport in tennis? He was a self-made man. He came up to Boise State, basically couldn't get a scholarship with the California schools, came up to Boise State and became a legend on the tennis courts. How did he do it? Like Jeremy Lin. He was on the edge, he was on the end of the bench, and he worked his way up through hard work, perseverance, competitiveness, a ferociousness, a resolve, and a joy for the battle, and also with preparation. And he had a vision. And he had that opportunity, and he grabbed that opportunity in his life, and look where he went. After he played at Boise State, he was, became good enough to consider a professional career. And it was amazing, he took a right turn, and we talked about this a lot. He took a right turn and he started working at Micron. Just a student intern that just worked his way up from the bottoms from the bottom of Micron to all the way to the top. And you know what? You can say these things to young men. But it doesn't mean anything. But when he comes in front of you and he just tells you the story of his life, how did it impact my players? What a gift. What an incredible gift to give to an 18, 19, 20-year-old whose life's ahead of him. They saw one of themselves there do it. Now, the greatest thing about Steve is I ask him, and I always ask this to everybody, I go, why do you do what you do? Why did you play tennis? And it was obvious, and Steve, and I remember him saying this to me at his favorite restaurant, Applebee's. <laughs> you know, you think you go out with Steve Appleton, and I'm just a sport tennis coach trying to get along with this greatness of Coach Peterson and the basketball coaches and everything, and he would take me to the place I belonged, Applebee's. And we talked about this. And it's one thing that's shaped my, my philosophy, the way that I work with players. He loved, he did what he did because he loved the feeling. Think about it, the feeling, how he felt. And you could see that in those videos. He loved the feeling, he loved to live life at a heightened state. And I sometimes contribute that, and I said, you know, to tennis, when you're a kid, when you're playing, you're out there all by yourself. You had to make the decisions. You had to prepare. You were naked to the world. The spotlight was on you. If you made the mistake, everybody saw it, and you had to accept it, and you had to be accountable. But he loved that feeling. He loved that feeling of taking risks. And it just got greater and greater, and I feel sometimes that tennis propelled him there, propelled him that way. The feeling. And you asked him what the greatest feeling was. And we differed on this, because he said the greatest feeling was to win, was the accomplishment. It was worth the toil, it was worth the pain, it was worth the time, because you give, when you're an athlete, you give the precious, most precious thing that you have, which is your time. And he gave it to this dream that he made a reality. And he would talk to my players about this. And I said, the greatest feeling, and you exemplify this, is to play. 
which means you're a spectator. You're not a watcher. You're not a participant. I mean, you're not a person that is watching. You're a doer. You participate. He participated in life. And he agreed, and we talked about that. And then the next greatest thing, I said, what's the next greatest thing? And we talked about it, it was a play for others. And that's the thing, that's the beauty of it. We're in the most, my sport's the most selfless sport in the world. It's all about me, I, I, I. You go along onto the court and it's just you. And all of a sudden what we do in college tennis, and that's the reason there's such a tie with the Broncos with Steve, and I understand it, is he was in a selfish sport and he was playing for others. And it gave resonance, it resonated in him. And what it did to him too is when he was playing for others, he became a leader. And he basically was, when you talk to the players, they're on the team and I don't know if they threw the picture up, but the, he became a leader, he became the player coach of that team. And those, his teammates were more than teammates. And great teams have this, is anybody can be on a team but they were a family and they were brothers and they meet every year. Steve would get together with them because no one understood in terms of learning how to compete, how of learning to put it on the line better than the people you do it with. And instead of his opponents and his teammates being competitors, they were mentors and he became the greatest mentor. An example of how he played for others when he was playing in the big sky championships and his goal was to win in singles he shattered his thumb on his right hand shattered it he got up and he had taped and he tried to play gripping without a thumb and let me tell you one thing that you learn when you're a tennis player is the most important digit in your life is the thumb and he couldn't hold on to it so what he did is he had the trainer tape it to the racket and he finished the match and urban legend has it that he won. I don't know for a fact, because he never told me if he won or not. He just, we talked about it and I laughed. The following week is the Big Sky Championships and he played with his hand taped to the racket and he reached the semis of the singles and he won the Big Sky doubles. His doubles partner, Chris Langdon, told me that one of the biggest mistakes he made in his life was in the doubles and the, when they realized that they were gonna win this, Hadn't been over yet. He gave a big high five to Steve, and Steve was withering in pain on the ground, but they still won. The next greatest feeling is to play well. Steve did it not well, he did it great. He did it great. Then he loved to win. He was a ferocious competitor. It was, he was recognized 17 people in the world have been recognized with the Intercollegiate Tennis Association Achievement Award. Steve Appleton from Boise, Idaho, who played for Boise State, is one of those 17. And they recognize him for what he did on the court at a little school where everybody thought we were potato heads. He did a little school and he basically transformed the landscape, first of all, of our tennis program, most importantly of my players' lives, the university, the state, and so many people's lives. I just want to go, I think, Steve did not fly. He soared through life. He was so many different things. He, was, he seized the moment. He lived life at the most heightened state of being ever. And you know what? I think for everybody who knew him, the beauty of it is that you got to soar with him. And the last, my last thing, and this is out of the mouth of babes, which is a 19 year old. And they looked at him, they said, you know what coach? That man was Prince Charming and Delenn was Cinderella. What an incredible story. Good morning. I'm Bob Custer, a president of Boise State University. I'm honored and privileged to be here today and to be asked by the Appleton and the Micron families to say a few words on behalf of our students, <clears throat> our faculty and staff, 
all of those who support Boise State, about the incredible impact this man had on this university as it has grown in these recent years. It would have been so easy for Steve Appleton to move on, to leave behind his undergraduate years, to leave behind his tennis years, to leave behind his degree in business in our College of Business and Economics, and to move on. He was one of the busiest men in America. He had enormous responsibility. Everyone would have understood if he was not there for his alma mater. But he was. But he took that time, that extra time, to find a way to be with us, to play a key leadership role for his alma mater in building a metropolitan research university in this town he called home, the town his company and his colleagues called home and depended upon for their workforce needs and their research collaborations. His competitive spirit, his energy, his passion is reflected in our faculty and their work, their research and their teaching, their programs and degree offerings, our emphasis on science and engineering, and the buildings that make it happen. From one end of the campus to the other, the brand new College of Business and Economics, it's gonna open up this fall. It wouldn't be there were it not for Steve, providing the leadership with his executive team at Micron to put the lead gift up front require that half of it be matching to get other people, other donors to contribute. And today that is now a reality. <clears throat> Thanks to Steve's leadership. The Appleton Tennis Center, of course, as the coach said, what an incredible contribution to his work here as a tennis player. Less visible, but clearly just as important, if not more important, are the degree programs Steve and Micron had such an impact over here at Boise State. The PhD in electrical engineering and computer science, the master's degree in material science engineering, the PhD in material science engineering, which he met with me on not more than a year ago and suggested we have a role to play here to build this college of engineering to be one of the best in the country. His commitment to his alma mater is evident from one end of the campus to the other, and it's abundant as well. But it wasn't just about writing the check that was, was, was interesting about Steve. Steve liked, liked to get into it. He, he could write the check, but only if he could be guaranteed that we were going to play by the same competitive, be the very best you can be rules that he played by. And so when I first came here as a university president, and I met with the Micron team and Steve, we kept going back three or four times to get the money for this building, the lead gift, and it wasn't going anywhere. And finally, we raised the question of, well, what's going on here? And the, que the answer was simple. Hey, we're not just talking about a building. We know the building can look nice. We want to know what's going to be in it. We want the very best programming. We want the very best faculty the very best degree offerings you have. Of course, uh, it wasn't just about giving for Steve. It was also about observing, participating. He was a fan. Greg mentioned that he, I mean, clearly he was in the arena in so many endeavors, but he was also a fan. And it was in this very arena for the last 23 years, right there. There's where Steve and his family sat as they rooted for our basketball program. He was so proud, so proud of his alma mater. One day last year, I was sitting in my office working, and it usually took, of course, for our two schedules to get together a month before we could ever figure out a way to meet and talk about the future and what comes next, and in he walks right down the hall, unannounced. And I, I'm thinking, I, I don't believe that he has the time and what's he doing here? And, and I look behind him and he had a young lady behind him. 
and he introduces me, beaming, proud as can be. This is my daughter, Marissa. She's a student here at Boise State. He was so proud of the fact that now the next generation of Appletons are Broncos at Boise State. And it wasn't even just about giving back to his, his alma mater. When you talk to Steve, you learned that he had another very serious and important motivation that every one of us in this great nation should consider. It was about keeping America strong and competitive across the globe and doing so, so with more graduates in science and engineering to strengthen our nation's position in the global economy and making his company stronger and more competitive in the global marketplace. Whether he was as CEO of Micron committing his own personal funds or the company's funds, he was not about to settle for just writing the check, as I said earlier, and walk away from a leadership role. When we embarked on our recent campaign, our comprehensive campaign that we just concluded, the consultant said, you just simply have to find the name in this community, the person who you can go to and get leadership for this campaign. Well, we, we thought of Steve Appleton and Alan Dykeman, who was his co-chair. And in Steve's case, I, I knew his schedule. We all knew that he traveled around the world, that he had all these enormous responsibilities, that it was tough to find him, uh, to nail him down for any one period of time. And this was going to require a little bit of work, but not a lot of work, maybe meetings two or three times a year. So I called him up and I, I gave him this sales pitch that we're, presidents are pretty good at giving. This isn't going to take any of your time, Steve. And don't you worry, we'll handle it for you. We'd like to have your name up there. And uh, so he said, well, what, what, what is involved in it? And I told him about these meetings. But don't you worry, Steve, if you can't make those meetings, that's all right. For the next five years, as we conducted that campaign and closed it out last year at $186 million, when we held those steering committee meetings, in walked Steve Appleton. It was on the schedule. He wanted to be there. He was participating. He was leading and guiding and directing. It was so, so impressive, given all the places that he could be and must be. As our friendship grew in, in recent years, because in the first few years I really didn't know Steve that well, but as our friendship grew it got to the point where I knew I could actually call on him for a piece of advice and counsel when a decision might get to my office that I was unsure of. And I remember one of those that I just have to share with you because it shows his, his passion for his alma mater, how much he cared about this university. Every now and then, we link up with donors who are interested in giving large sums of money in return for some kind of a naming opportunity. And this was one of those deals where the naming opportunity was going to be very visible to all of Bronco Nation. And I was a little concerned that it wasn't the right fit, that folks wouldn't fall in line appropriately and understand where we were going, and I just needed some help and advice. But I didn't want to let Steve know I had these concerns, so I approached it very objectively with him, and on a Saturday afternoon, I called him on his cell phone. I didn't even know whether I'd hear from him for days. I get a call back an hour later. Steve. I got a problem. I said, I've got to run something by you here. I've got a donor who's very generous, very well-intentioned, wanting to put a name up here, over here, wherever it is, and uh, told him the details that I can't share, of course, with uh, all of you. And uh, there was a pause for a minute, and then he said, are you crazy? Are you nuts? And then there was this dead silence on the phone, because I thought he was going to jump right through the cell phone. And in that dead silence, I realized he's thinking, do I know this guy well enough to see, ask him if he's crazy or he's nuts? <laughs> and then he backed off. And then well, I, well, what I really meant to say was, do you think, well, I don't know whether that's, and we went on and on. And in the end, he gave me just the piece of advice that I needed and that this university needed. So on a personal note, 
just in these last few years, uh, those uh, lunches at Murphy's have been a lot of fun. And I'm going to miss Steve's leadership. I'll miss that twinkle in his eye I heard mentioned at the funeral service. That, that twinkle in the eye was kind of an early warning signal. Here comes a Steve Appleton special, and it's going to be a challenge to push the envelope way beyond the boundaries. And I heard that many times, and how refreshing. I used his incredibly high expectation of standards and performance that came through in every conversation we had to push myself and to push this university to do more and to do it better, and as only Steve would have it, to do it best. Someone once said that trying to change a university is like trying to move a cemetery. And, I, and Steve and I joked about that a lot because he, 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 like many, could not quite understand the processes and the bureaucracy and how much time it takes to get things done in universities. He'd share with me these stories of the international competition that he and Micron faced to spur me on, to suggest that the university should adapt, change, challenge the status quo, reach for excellence and distinction, so our students will be able to meet the challenges that lie ahead in this new century. The toughest part for so many of us who counted on Steve's leadership is simply imagining life without him. What do we do now? What do we do next? Will, will it ever be the same? Well, obviously, in one sense, it will never, ever be the same. But in another way, that is really up to each and every one of us. The greatest tribute we can pay to a man of Steve's medal and extraordinary leadership is to pick up the torch and complete his journey. And to do so with the drive for excellence and the distinction that is emblematic of Steve's life and career. We at Boise State are here today to say thanks to Steve Appleton and to promise to Lynn and her family and the Micron family that we will carry his torch and always light the way for the innovation and the excellence in all he did and in all we must do. He will not be soon forgotten by the alma mater, he never forgot. Thank you, Delin and family, for sharing his generous spirit with Boise State University, its students, faculty, and staff, the entire community. I just have this feeling that in this hall of competition, which he frequented so often, that if we all listen very carefully, we would hear one last time, probably from that seat right over there, a Go Broncos. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Brian Tuohy, and I'm president of the Semiconductor Industry Association. And I'm honored today to play a small part in remembering Steve Appleton and his contributions to our industry and our nation. Despite his youth, Steve was the longest serving member of, the, of our association's board of directors. And he was one of our industry's most energetic champions. He was an important voice on the SIA board, and his colleagues looked to him for inspiration and advice. He was a fierce competitor, and his spirit of competition drove others to be their best. He was an ambassador of technology, a voice for the innovative spirit of America, which he typified. He leaves an enduring legacy on our association and our industry. Just a few short months ago, at our annual meeting in November, 
Steve received the Semiconductor Industry's highest honor, the Robert N. Noyce Award. The Noyce Award, named after the co-inventor of the integrated circuit and, and pioneer who helped found Fairchild Semiconductor and in Intel, is reserved for those luminaries that not only successfully lead major companies, but also play a larger role as a champion for the industry. How appropriate that Steve is part of this elite group of icons, known not only for their business leadership, but for their passion for life, their love of family, and their dedication to their employees and their communities. As many of you know, the U.S. semiconductor industry has faced tremendous challenges. In the late 1980s and 1990s, a steady onslaught of unfair trade practices by our competitors threatened to wipe the U.S. industry out. The memory sector was at the tip of the spear, but the entire industry was affected. Steve responded to this threat by working tirelessly to execute a plan to save the industry. He and his fellow executives banded together to insist on fair international playing field, a series of government industry research partnerships, and a better appreciation by our government leaders of the fundamental economic and national security importance of the U.S. semiconductor industry. He firmly believed that given a level playing field, Micron and other U.S. companies could outcompete anyone in the world. And by sheer force of will, he helped forge agreements and institutions that enabled U.S. companies to compete and win in the memory sector and beyond. It was truly remarkable. In the early 1990s, the U.S. industry was overtaken by Japan, and our market share was falling rapidly. However, as a result of the efforts that Steve championed, the industry regained the lost ground and climbed again to over 50% of the global market share, with no other country above 20, a position it maintains to this day. This accomplishment, winning the global fight, typifies Steve Appleton. He wasn't content to merely be a player, he wanted to be the best, and he wanted his company to be the best, and he wanted his nation to be the leader. Behind the impressive numbers and statistics are the tens of thousands of employees and their families that were made better because of this fight. This city, this state, and our country are better off for his drive for excellence. Our industry is a leader because men like Steve Appleton made it so. It is staggering to think of the ripple effect that Steve's efforts have had on communities across the country. One of the institutions critical to the industry's resurgence that Steve championed was the World Semiconductor Council, or WSC, a unique forum where industry leaders and governments come together to proactively solve trade issues, create international standards, and further environmental stewardship. Steve, its longest serving member, believed deeply in this organization as a way to avoid the fractious trade, trade wars of the 1980s and 90s, and he devoted an enormous amount of time and energy in, to build this forward-looking and productive organization. At last week's WSC meetings in Taiwan, much of the talk was of Steve. His friends and colleagues from around the world remembered his accomplishments, his competitiveness, his warm personality. There was an outpouring of heartfelt condolences. They expressed their deep admiration for Steve's accomplishments and appreciation for his friendship. Many recalled Steve's leadership during the early days of the WSC. And while this is a forum of fierce competitors, it was telling that all recognized Steve, Steve as a world leader who rose above the short-term divisive issues and instead sought common ground. All who attended were sure that Steve's legacy will live on in future WSC accomplishments and his spirit of gracious professionalism will endure. In addition to building common ground internationally, Steve was critical to building collaborative government industry research partnerships here in the United States. These innovative organizations produce both basic discoveries and a strong pipeline of talented engineers. Yet another legacy that Steve leaves to SIA is the importance of educating government officials from the U.S. and around the world about the industry 
and insisting on policies that enable competitive environment for us to flourish. He was a real pro at explaining our complex policy issues in the halls of Congress and spoke with enormous credibility. And when he spoke, everyone listened because his comments came from a place of honesty, clarity, and true passion. He frequently extolled the importance of promoting advanced manufacturing here in America and pointed to Micron, always with a proud smile, as a shining example. Today, when you hear the president and congressional leaders talk about advanced manufacturing policies, you can hear echoes of Steve's many admonitions. In addition to his impressive professional achievements, he's also remembered by his colleagues for his loyalty, grace, and dignity, and his friendliness and approachability. He had the rare ability to treat everyone he met, regardless of title, with the same eye of favor. It seems nearly everyone in the SI family has a personal story of how our interaction with Steve touched their lives. Please know that all of us at SIA will miss Steve. Our industry and our association will be forever altered because of his efforts, and we resolve to build upon his legacy. Our industry and our country have lost a visionary, an icon, and a friend. Robert Noyce once said, don't be encumbered by history. Go off and do something wonderful. There is no question that Steve embraced Noyce's challenge to the fullest. On behalf of our board of directors and the entire SIA organization, please allow me to express our heartfelt condolences to the Appleton family and the entire Micron community. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Governor Butch Otter of the state of Idaho. I've been asked to speak on the state of Idaho and on behalf of the state of Idaho in what Steve Appleton meant to Idaho. And I can only do that through the prism of Butch Otter. And my personal relationship with Steve, unfortunately, in almost every capacity that I dealt with Steve, was uh, as, a government, as a government official. First, as Lieutenant Governor of the State of Idaho. Second, as a member of the United States Congress. And then, finally, as Governor of the State. And you must know that Steve Appleton was very impatient with government. <laughs> I, cannot, uh, I cannot think of a meeting that I had with Steve Appleton that lasted more than maybe 15 or 20 minutes. But I do remember the first time that Steve and I appeared together, and it was before a group of young leaders for Idaho. He had just become president uh, of Micron. I had been lieutenant governor of the state for some time. And these young leaders coming together with the young president's organization from all over the United States had come to Boise uh, for an opportunity to talk about leadership and about vision. And so when Steve and I first met there, uh, I found out that he was a Bronco. He was a graduate of Boise State University. And I said, well, Steve, you know, I too am a Boise State alumni. Well, I had to admit it was Boise Junior College. And he, and, uh, he said, well, you know, I am the first president of an Idaho-based company that is a Forbes 500 that graduated from Boise State. And I said, well, that's great. I'm the first lieutenant governor <laughs> of Idaho that graduated, that uh, uh, is a, an alumni of Boise State. Uh, and then as our relationship continued to grow, he continued to grow uh, with Micron. I, on the other hand, continued to grow, unfortunately, in government, which he was still impatient with when I went to Congress. But I can tell you that uh, in those very short meetings, I learned an awful lot about my friend Steve. Uh, he was a man of few words. For instance, in 1995, when we were faced with the migration north from Boise State campus, and they had to go to the University of Idaho in order to receive the engineering degrees that they needed, even though 
Micron had stood the burden of those early years of education, but to get them to that final degree, they would have to travel north and then many of them didn't come back. And so Micron was losing their investment. Uh, they were trying very hard to get a little closer to their operation, like on Boise State's campus, an engineering school. And so Governor Batt, my boss at that time, asked me to see what we could work out between then President Rook and President Zinzer. And so I called a meeting, we, we got everything pretty well put together, and uh, I thought, you know, this thing is going right along. And so then it was time for uh, Micron's input into this marriage, if you will. A man of few words. When he came in and we started talking about it, he said, so what's the problem? Build it. Well, we did. Uh, not right then, because there was some resistance. Uh, but that's another story. Many years later, when I was serving in the United States Congress and serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, we got wind of a World Bank loan to a foreign country a foreign country whose habit had been to, once they did get that loan from the World Bank uh, and the Inter International Monetary Fund, was to uh, grant then, through their government offices, certain subsidies to organizations and to operations within their nation state, which made them highly competitive and subsidized into existence. And Steve came to my office and we sat down once again, it didn't take long for the meeting to reach its point of attack. He said, stop it. We did. When I was first asked to speak today, I struggled a great deal with what I could possibly say. I, I just found the words that I, I thought I needed to say would constantly escape me. And so I looked for some help. And I found that help. And it was from a person I would have liked to have known, a guy by the name of Jack London. And he wrote, I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in brilliant illusion than it should be suffered in dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. The proper function of man is to exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I shall live my life. He did that and in doing so, he touched many of us and we each have our own personal stories. But Steve was a giver and I for one, took a whole lot more than I gave back. He showed me the courage that it takes in leadership with his guidance of Micron of what needed to be done and when it needed to be done and not to be hesitant about it. If you're right, go forward. Many of those same, same lessons that I learned from Steve, I've had to use in the last four years because we too have had to make a lot of tough decisions. Fortunately, I had somebody that was clearing the trail ahead of me and showing me the way. More than once, I have had the opportunity to point out to the state legislature and to the people of Idaho that the Micron model in making tough decisions when they have to be made is a model worth following and a leader worth following. Steve never let conventional wisdom or the safe path deter him from the goals that he had set for himself personally and for Micron. And his goals always involved making the world around him a better place for those who would follow to realize their own dreams for their own life. You know, I would like to, if, if I had the opportunity today, to say to Steve a few words, because he was a man of few words. These are the words that I'd say. Husband and father, legendary. Businessman, a leader. 
innovator, Edison-esque. Friend, golden. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Mark Durkin, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as Micron's CEO in honor of Steve's legacy and moving the company forward. As I thought about what to say to you today, I knew that being the last speaker, you would already know, if you didn't already as dear friends of his, that he was generous, that he was intelligent, that he was kind, giving in every way, an ultra competitor, and a man who always did rather than observe or comment on. Steve was a remarkable human being. What I'd like to do today is tell you just a couple of stories from long ago and far away when Steve had long curly hair, and so did I. <laughs> to give you a sense of, of where Steve came from and, and, and how uh, he accomplished some of the things he accomplished. I knew about Steve before I ever met him. And I knew about Steve because he was already legendary on the fab floor when I started working at Micron back in 1984. All the operators knew him, the engineering managers, the shift managers, they all knew about Steve Appleton, and they knew about him because they all knew that Steve had their back. The story goes that once upon a time, Micron did something it rarely did, which was hire a supervisor from outside. And the supervisor came in and took a look around and, and quickly identified a number of operators, new on the job, probably undertrained as most of us were in those days, and identified them as, as underperformers that needed to be replaced. But Steve, also new on the job, but early in his management career, took a look around and said, I'm not sure that's right. Steve went out and interviewed every person on that floor, got the real story, and eliminated the new supervisor. So as Steve walked around that floor, he already had the respect of everyone at Micron, even though he'd only been there a short while. When I started a little while after that, I soon had a similar experience of my own. In those days, we all worked long hours. We were under-resourced. We never had enough people to get done what we had to get done, and the competition was intense. Many times we'd work 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, and Steve was there uh, uh, leading the way. But there, there came a time when after a, a, a long, long shift, myself, a young engineer who thought he knew a lot more than he did, uh, was trying to do too, too many things at once. And we were near the end of a work week, we were all rushing to try and ship a certain number of wafers and hit our target. And Steve, of course, as a production manager at the time, was right on top of everything. As I realized the mistake I'd made that day, uh, misprocessing a bunch of wafers that were just ready to ship out to customers, Steve walked in the room and saw all the wafers were the wrong color and immediately realized what I had done. There were no recriminations, knowing that we were now going to miss our targets. There were no uh, uh, long discussions about how to behave going forward. What Steve said was, don't worry, Mark, I got this one covered. And he grabbed those wafers and he headed off. That was the last I ever heard of it. I'm quite sure he figured out how to rework them and ship them on out. But that was the kind of person Steve was, and that was why he always had the trust and respect of everyone at Micron. A number of years later, we, I had, a, I had a, an, an occasion uh, to experience uh, Steve again in a similar light. In this time frame, uh, uh, roughly 10 to 12 years later, uh, we were all, at this point, now a global company. We had, uh, I think, through, through Steve's leadership and vision, uh, managed our way successfully through the acquisition of Texas Instruments uh, memory operations and become overnight 
a global competitor with offices all around the world. And we were still all working hard, and Steve was still leading the way. But one morning, a, uh, an executive who I won't name just yet, maybe I'll name him in a minute, <laughs> came into work and, and left a note on Steve's door. It was about 6 a.m., left a note on Steve's door. Steve, give me a call when you can, 6.05. Of course, Steve came rolling in just a few minutes later, grabbed the note off the door, and stormed into the executive's office and said, I'm here. What does this mean when you get in? Of course, they had an interesting discussion about that. <laughs> but the next morning, true to form, Steve was in at 5.50. <laughs> and the note was on the other executive's door. <laughs> Jay. Jay Hawkins, that is. <laughs> Jay, when you get in, give me a call. Of course, that wasn't the end of it. We were a global company, and, and the next morning, Jay had a, had a, uh, a call with Singapore, 4.30 a.m. And he was just licking his chops to get even with Steve. But it didn't go the way Jay planned, because when he walked into his office about 4.30, opened the office door and turned on the light. There was Steve, rolling in laughter. <laughs> About time you got in, Jay. <laughs> so, so Steve was hard driving. He always pushed us all hard, and he always led by example. But he was also a lot of fun. He was a great guy to work with, and we all enjoyed it. My experience was with Steve generally revolved around work. It had to be that way because although Steve was loyal to the core, he wanted to make sure that his loyalty was always predicated on, on earned respect, not on shared experiences and friendship. Although he was a great friend and someone who we will never forget, he always made sure that what we were focused on was the successful future of Micron. And the reason he did that was because he cared so deeply about Micron itself, the company, and every one of his employees out there. He would work night and day and night and day to protect that company. And now we have the honor of doing that together moving forward to honor his legacy. Steve was a wonderful family man. As I have spent the last few years working more closely with him than I ever have previously, I had the opportunity to travel with him often and to share many plane rides back to Boise late at night. And it was during those times that we took the opportunity to talk to each other about what we both cared most about. And I can tell you that as much as Steve loved Micron, and as much as Steve loved Boise State and his racing and his flying, there was nothing closer to his heart than his family, Delyn, the children, Bella, Jake, Marissa, Melissa. It was a great honor to work with Steve and to know him personally and to have all those fun times together. We're here today to remember him, but not to forget him. So with that, I would like to now uh, ask the Micron team members to stand. On behalf of all the Micron team members worldwide, we'd like to present to Dlin today and the family, the Appleton family, a flag that was flying at Micron on that day just a few weeks ago. Gordon Haller here, one of our, in fact, our longest now serving Micron employee is here with the flag. It's a symbol of our deep appreciation for all he's done for Micron, the community, the state at large. Thank you, Appletons. Over the last few weeks, I've been reading, you may, you may be seated, thank you. Over the last few weeks, I've been reading numerous 
letters, cards, acknowledgement of all the ways that Steve has touched so many of us in the room today and around the world not able to be here today. And thousands of emails. So for those of you uh, to whom I have not yet responded, I will still respond. I'm working on many of them. Steve was larger than life, yet unassuming. He always had the small guy in mind from that very first day at Micron. He always knew that he was capable of greatness and, and was going to be great and do great things. But he never forgot that everyone else was a human being too and deserving of great respect, kind treatment. We have a short video that I'd like to share with you now. It, it reminds us of what all the letters that I read over the last number of weeks reminded me, that so many of us regarded Steve as a hero, and this video is called Heroes. I joined Micron Technology in 1983 in production. It was great to have the opportunity to work my way up. When I first started with Micron, everybody did a lot of different jobs. It's been a hard day's night, and I've been working like a dog. Here at Micron, we recognize that our productivity depends on the company's ability to inspire. Come on, Willie, we need to get you to the river. At Micron, our people are the source of ideas. People who want to contribute and make a difference. In a dynamic, worldwide, competitive industry, that's the way it's got to be. Heroes, larger than life, up on the screen, every night. On the late show Ooh, what a great show Heroes Under the gun Fighting for justice For everyone And we follow Wherever I started uh, at $4.46 an hour working graveyard shift uh, in production. We must insist that neither the Korean government nor the IMF be permitted to guarantee or underwrite private loans of Korean manufacturers. We are the only U.S. manufacturer that's left in this business. I'd like to thank all our speakers today for helping us remember Steve. I'd like to thank Boise State University for providing this wonderful forum, for all the team members at Micron that helped put this event together. 
And I'd like to thank you all for coming today to join us in remembering Steve Appleton. We won't forget him. There will be a short flyover uh, about 10 or 15 minutes from now. Uh, the planes will come from the north and head uh, south between uh, the building we're in here and the stadium. So uh, those of you uh, that want to might look for that on your way out. Thank you very much all for coming. And there you have our live coverage of the public memorial for longtime Micron CEO Steve Appleton. We have reporters there at Taco Bell Arena who will be getting reaction, talking with people who knew Steve Appleton, and we'll bring those stories to you tonight, live at 5, 6, and 10, right here on today's Channel 6. We'll see you then. We now return you to regular programming.